in football, there is a penalty called for unnecessary roughness. Football is a rough game, but if someone is rough, especially after the whistle has been blown, the flag is thrown, and the whole team is penalized for unnecessary roughness. Some might think that tonight's study is unnecessary roughness as I deal with a divisive doctrine that many believe is uh, very controversial, but all of us are Christians on both sides. They say it's a secondary issue. It's not something to divide over. But I beg to differ. I think this is necessary roughness tonight. The Bible tells us to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to us. And the doctrines of Calvinism, Reformed theology, are not secondary. It is the doctrine of God, and it is the doctrine of salvation. And so tonight we come to the first of the five principal parts of Calvinism, usually known as TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance or preservation of the saints. Last week we looked at divine sovereignty. Underlying all of that is a view of God as foreordaining everything that comes to pass. Last week we tried to show the Bible shows clearly that God does not foreordain sin, therefore God does not foreordain everything that comes to pass. God is sovereign, but he is not omnicausal. The first of the five points is T, total depravity. And when someone asks, are you Calvinist, they say you're either a one-pointer, a two-pointer, a five-pointer. A two-pointer was what most people at my school, my alma mater, said they were. They believed in total depravity and eternal security or the preservation of the saints. They thought they believed in total depravity. Does that mean that mankind is sinful? Oh yes, every Baptist believes that mankind is sinful. But that's not what Calvin meant by total depravity. It is better called total inability. And the question becomes, do humans really have no free will? That's what Reformed theology teaches. I am Jeff Hartman, pastor of Troy First Baptist Church, and I welcome not only our live audience, but those who will be joining us later on as we look tonight at this very important doctrine, some necessary roughness, do humans really have no free will? I want to allow them to speak for themselves and define their theology. This is the Westminster Confession of Faith. And in the Westminster Confession of Faith that all Reformed churches fall into, they say, man by his fall into a state of sin hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, that is key, dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. Now I can agree with that last line. Human beings are not able by their own strength to convert themselves or even prepare themselves. But when you talk about total inability of will to do any spiritual good, including placing your faith in Christ, receiving the gift of salvation, this becomes a totally other thing. In defining what they believe, I'm going to use this book. It's called The Five Points of Calvinism, Defined, Defended, and Documented. I had the original 1963 edition for many years. It's been updated in 2004 written by David Steele, Curtis Thomas, and Lance Quinn. And I'm going to allow them to tell you what they believe. But first, let's start with what they believe. We believe. They say that those of us who believe in free will have, an ability, have an, a view of human ability. Do we believe in free will? Well, of your own free will, you would probably say yes. They say those of us who believe in free will this is what that is defined as. Although human nature was seriously affected by the fall, man has not been left in a state of total helplessness. God graciously enables every sinner to repent and believe, but he does so in such a manner as to not interfere with man's freedom. And to most Christians, we'd say, amen. That's what we believe the Bible says. Continuing on page six, the sinner has the power either to cooperate with God's Spirit and be regenerated or to resist God's grace and perish. They would suggest that this is not what the Bible teaches. They would suggest that when 
Billy Graham gave an invitation to come forward. He was asking people dead in sin to do something that they were unable to do. They say that this is a false view of what humans can do, what humans are, what the Bible teaches. They teach something quite different than human ability or free will. This is their view of total depravity or better, total inability. This is what they say, because of the fall, man is unable of himself to savingly believe the gospel. The sinner is dead, blind, and deaf to the things of God. His heart is deceitful and desperately corrupt. The Calvinist demands that we cannot do anything and then uses the picture of the sinner is dead. But then dead and blind and deaf, doesn't that seem kind of redundant? Once you say someone's dead, you don't have to say, we'll see if they can see anything. We'll see if they can hear anything. If you're dead, by definition, you're blind and deaf. But here's one thing, dead people can't deceive. They can't be desperately corrupt. So they take one image from scripture. Yes, dead in sin is one of the ways that the Bible describes fallen sinners. But they then insist that sin makes us dead and makes us totally unable to receive Christ. Let's continue with Steele's definition, page five. His will is not free. I'm not free. He's not free to say anything other than that. And I'm not free to disagree with him because everything is forwarding by God. Remember, that's their assumption from last week. We don't have free will. Everything we do, say, even think, even sinful, is determined by God. We have no free will. Our will is in bondage to our evil nature. Therefore, he will not fall in human beings. Indeed, he cannot choose good over evil in the spiritual realm. Are they saying that no one has ever overcome temptation and said no to sin? Well, we know that's not true. In our own lives, we've said no to something we were tempted to do. So it seems on the, just on the cover here that this is an obvious falsehood. But what they're saying is cannot choose salvation in Christ as opposed to going our own way. Continuing their definition of total inability... Consequently, it takes much more than the Spirit's assistance to bring a sinner to Christ. It takes regeneration. What does regeneration mean? It means giving new life. So we're dead. What we need is new life. We need new life so we can have faith in Christ. That's what they're saying. So we can't have faith in Christ until Christ saves us by regeneration, by which the Spirit makes the sinner alive and gives him a new nature. So, this is the teaching that regeneration precedes faith. We don't trust in Christ until Christ has already saved us. They say faith is not something man contributes to salvation. I don't know that anyone imagines that we contribute anything to God by believing in him, but that's how they disparage our view. Faith is not something man contributes to salvation, but is itself a part of God's gift of salvation. They're saying faith is God's gift to us. Faith is God believing in himself through us. If God's gift to the sinner, it is God's gift to the sinner, not the sinner's gift to God. Again, let them define terms in page 18. When Calvin's, Calvinists speak of man as being totally depraved, they mean, and this is a Calvinist speaking, that man's nature is corrupt, perverse, and sinful throughout. Well, that's something that we would all agree on. Yes, man's nature is corrupt, perverse, and sinful throughout. Even our best intentions are tainted by sin. The adjective total does not mean that each sinner is as totally or completely corrupt in his actions and thoughts as it is possible for him to be. So this is obvious on the surface, right? Nobody is as evil as they could be. Hitler could have been worse, right? And Mother Teresa could have been worse than she was. We all know that there are some things that we could have done, that we were tempted to do, that we chose not to do, we overcame it. So they're saying it's not totally depraved as in we are all the worst that we can be. He continues, instead, the word total is used to indicate that the whole of man's being has been affected by sin. We would agree. 
The corruption extends to every part of man, we would agree, his body and soul. Sin has affected all, the totality of man's faculties, his mind, his will, etc. Yes, we would agree, it has affected our wills. Does that mean we don't have a will anymore? I don't believe so. And then he says, the natural man is enslaved to sin. Wait a minute, I thought we were dead. Anyone want to buy a dead slave? How much is a dead slave worth? He is a child of Satan, rebellious toward God. Wait a minute. Can a dead person be rebellious? Blind to the truth. How many dead people are blind? All of them, by definition. Corrupt. How many dead people are corrupt? They may be physically corrupt as they decay. Unable to save themselves. Of course, dead people are unable to do anything, including, hint, hint, sin. And to prepare himself for salvation. In short, the unregenerate man is dead in sin, and his will is enslaved to his evil nature. Dead people don't have wills. So we're here mixing the metaphors. A dead slave is no good. And here each, each phrase seems to contradict the one before. Continues on page 19. Adam's descendants are still free to choose. Well, I thought we were dead. Dead people don't choose which sock they put on first. Dead people don't choose whether to say good morning or hello. Dead people don't say anything. Adam's descendants are still free to choose. Every man makes choices throughout life. But inasmuch as Adam's offspring are born with sinful natures, they do not have the ability, remember it's total inability, to choose spiritual good over evil. Consequently, man's will is no longer free. It's one thing to say that we are tainted by sin, that we are prone to sin. It's another thing to say that we are dead in sin and we can do no good, and it's another thing to say we have no free will. Again, go back to the Westminster Confession. Man, by his fall into sin, into a state of sin, hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. Of course, we agree that you cannot lift yourself by your own bootstraps. We have no part <clears> of our <throat> salvation. We receive it as a gift. They say we are dead in sin. How much hope is there for a dead person? There's no hope. Dead people can't hope, and those who have lost a loved one lose hope for that one who's gone. But now let's ask, let's respond. What does total depravity mean? And so we're looking at defining total depravity. We all agree, A, that humans are sinful and depraved. To say total depravity is to say we're sinful, we are all sinful, and that's certainly scriptural. If you've ever looked at the Romans Road, you probably know Romans 3.10 and Romans 3.23. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. For all have sinned, verse 23 says, and fall short of the glory of God. Every Baptist believes that human beings are sinful. Totally depraved, depends on by what you mean totally. All of us are affected, but not all of us are as bad as we can be. That brings us to number two. B, all agree that we are not totally depraved. We're not as bad as we can be. Total depravity, if I were to take that term, I don't because of what they mean by it. We're as bad off as we can be without Christ. There is no hope for us. But are we totally depraved? No, Jesus says in the red letters, Matthew 7, 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? What does Jesus concede here? Even depraved sinners, pagans, atheists, people who worship false gods, they do good things. They love their children. They give them gifts. They take good care of them. They might do nice neighborly things for their neighbors. Jesus here agrees that we are not as bad as we can be. In Acts, we see this fleshed out in the life of Cornelius, an unbeliever. But Cornelius was a certain man in Caesarea who was a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. That's his job. 
but the Bible calls him a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Have you ever met someone who wasn't a Christian, but they seemed like a nicer person than a lot of Christians you've met? That's this guy. So now, he became a Christian, but before he was a Christian, did he do good works that were preparing him for salvation? No, but he truly wanted to be a better man. And he tried to do good things, and the Bible tells us that this unsaved man was devout, and he gave generously. He even feared God, even though he had not received the gift of salvation. So when we say total depravity, we are not saying total inability. Calvinists believe depravity is total inability, which means we have no free will, which means I am not freely saying this, and I may be wrong, but God is making me say it. But why would God make more than half of Christianity believe we have free will when indeed we don't, and only a minority believe we don't? We would all agree we're as bad off as we can be, but we cannot agree with Calvinists who teach that total inability is what is true of human beings and that we don't have free will. We'll see why the Bible clearly teaches we have free will, but let's start with that image of dead in sin. Are we dead in sin? In one respect, yes. But remember that it is an image, it's a figure of speech. It is not literally used. Ephesians 2 says, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived following the course of this world. So yes, in one sense, the Bible describes us as dead in sin, but it also talks about us being blind. It also talks about us being a lot of other things. But here, he is not saying that we don't have free will. The dead don't have free will, but the dead is not a literal thing. It's a figure of speech. I want you to know that the dead can't believe but like I said earlier, the dead can't sin, and we certainly do sin. The dead can't reject Christ. Wait for it. The dead can't be slaves. It's a figure of speech, and Romans 5.12 uses this figure of speech. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, death spread to all men, physically, literally, and also spiritually and figuratively, because all sinned. So we literally will die. Adam and Eve did not die when they sinned, but they did become dead spiritually. Here's the question. Although we are dead in sin, according to Ephesians 2 and Romans 5, are we able to accept the gift of salvation? The question is not whether we are literally dead or not. We know that we are not. If we are figuratively dead, are we able to accept a gift and place our faith and trust in Christ? Second, there's an image in the Bible of having dark minds and corrupt hearts. Yes, the Bible teaches we have both, but the dead don't have dark minds, and the dead can't be hostile to God. Romans 8, 7 and 8, For this reason the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. The dead are not hostile to God or anything. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. The dead can't do anything. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The Bible does teach that human beings in their sinful state are hostile to God. That doesn't teach total inability. That teaches the opposite. And we see dark minds and corrupt hearts in the well-known verse, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yes, even my best intentions can be tainted by sin. But that doesn't mean that I'm dead. As a matter of fact, this teaches that I'm not dead because dead people can't lie. Dead people can't deceive. Can we accept a gift and have faith? That's the question. Does the Bible use the picture of death and sin? Yes. Also, dark minds and corrupt hearts. Also, it calls us slaves to sin and to Satan. Jesus says in John 8, 34, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Well, if that was the overarching picture as opposed to death, and we wouldn't imagine inability. Slaves may be limited in what they're allowed to do, but not what they can do necessarily. Slavery, though, slaves are not dead. Dead are not slaves. We see the same picture in 1 John 5, 19. The whole world lies under the power of the evil one. 
But does that mean that we can't accept a gift from God? Does that mean we have total inability? Yes, the Bible says, fourth, we are unable to save ourselves. We agree wholeheartedly with our Calvinist friends. Job 14, 4 says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. We can't save ourselves. Matthew 7, 18, Jesus says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Yes, of course we can't save ourselves. But does that mean we can't accept a gift when it's offered to us? I may be dead broke and have no money to my name. Does that mean I can't accept a gift from someone else? Of course not. It's not implied. And fifth, we are, according to them, unable to repent or have faith. Total inability not only means no free will, but we can't even accept the gift of salvation. And here's one of their proof texts. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. They glorify God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. These are Jews rejoicing when the newborn church, which was totally made up of converted Jews in the beginning, began seeing converts to Christianity from the Gentiles. And they were excited by it at first. Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. They read into that, oh, God granted them, God gave them repentance. Of course, when you and I read it, we see that clearly as God has granted them the opportunity to repent, right? If I ask you a favor and then I, I grant you opportunity to say yes or no. I didn't give you anything. I gave you an opportunity to respond. So here it doesn't necessarily teach what they try to make it teach. And also in Ephesians 2.8, here's a verse you know well, probably have memorized it along the way. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You have probably never read it to the way that they read it, but here's the way they read this loved verse. Grace, you've been saved through faith, and that faith, not of yourselves, is the gift of God. In other words, they say faith is the gift of God. You can't even place your faith in God until he gives you faith, and God, in essence, believes in himself through you. This is the very heart of their system. It is a misreading of the scripture, which I'll explain in a moment, but it's very important to their system. We can't even have faith in God. We can't repent unless he grants us repentance. We can't even have faith unless God gives it to us. That is the teaching of Calvinism, Reformed theology. And here is the essence of it all. R.C. Sproul said this is the heart, the key to Reformed theology. Regeneration precedes faith. Now this is so counterintuitive to us. We see the Bible saying over and over again, believe and be saved, believe and be saved. They say that's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. They say, be saved, and then you will believe. We think of it this way. If you will just place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he will save you. No, no, no. They say that's exactly the wrong way to think. God saves us. He regenerates us. The Holy Spirit comes in us, and he gives us faith and regeneration, and then we believe. Here's where they get that. Here's their proof text, John 6, 44. No one can come to me, Jesus speaking, unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. The Bible nowhere teaches regeneration precedes faith. The Calvinists can't point to one verse where regeneration precedes faith. But here they suggest no one can come to the Father unless the Father does something first. And so they say this drawing is God giving us life, God regenerating us, God giving us faith and giving us repentance. We'll explain what this verse means in just a moment. But I want you to see that none of these things that Calvinists teach would you ever discover by reading through your Bible from cover to cover without someone telling you what it meant. I call this the Gideon Bible method. If you were to go into a hotel, pick up a Gideon Bible and start reading the Gospel of John or start reading anywhere, you would assume that we have free will. The Bible tells us hundreds of times to choose to follow Christ, to repent, to have faith. We would assume that faith comes before regeneration. The only way you can ever come to these is by the system driving your study of Scripture. I would suggest to us, to be honest, Scripture should determine how we read, where our system comes from. We should not interpret Scripture by our system. 
we should change our system based upon scripture. Inevitably, this one though, total depravity is so key. So when we give away this one, say, well, I'm a Baptist, I'm a two-pointer, I believe in total depravity and eternal security. If you give them total depravity as defined by them, you give them ULI as well. Because if we have no ability, then God must unconditionally elect us. That's our study next week. And then God probably only dies for those that he unconditionally elects. And then God irresistibly saves those who he chooses. Let's see what the Bible does say. That's what Calvinism teaches. Here is what to, to be as humble as I can, what I believe the Bible clearly says about total inability and who we are as human beings. A, we understand enough to be morally responsible. The Bible does not teach we are totally unable. As a matter of fact, I think it clearly teaches that we understand enough to be morally responsible for the choice we make or we don't make. For instance, Romans chapter 1. Men suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest, obvious in them. God has shown it to them. What does that verse teach? We know the truth. We know it and it offends us, so we suppress it. You ever try to hold down a blow-up balloon or something under the water in the pool? A life-saving? It keeps on popping at the surface, right? That's the truth of God. It's everywhere. We know it. We try to suppress it, but we can't. Why do we do it? In unrighteousness. What may be known of God, it doesn't say we can't know God. It says it may be known of God. It's obvious in us, for God has shown it to us. Continue. For since the creation of the world, <coughs> his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Are we blind? In a manner of speaking, but are we totally blind, totally unable? No, the Bible says it's clearly seen, even by unbelievers. And it's understood. Do we have dark minds? Yes, but not so dark that we can't understand. Being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let me tell you what an excuse would be. If I could stand before God and say, I didn't receive Christ as Savior, but that's not my fault, that's yours. You gave me no ability. You didn't choose me with unconditional election. You didn't even have Christ die for me. Total depravity as defined by Calvinists. Total inability makes total irresponsibility. Do we have dark minds? Yes, but they're rebellious, so they're not dead. The Bible says that we do have enough ability to understand so that we are morally responsible. Moral responsibility demands ability, right? God can't condemn us for not repenting if we can't repent. Other verses along this line, Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Notice what it doesn't say. You will seek me and find me when I give you the ability to search for me with all your heart. God speaks as if it's up to us. Is it up to us? No, God had to take the first step, and he did. But he is making himself able to be found and we can find him, not if he gives us the ability. He's given us the ability. That's what we believe the Bible clearly teaches. Revelation 22, the last chapter, the last book. God's final invitation. Come, let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Whoever God chooses, not whoever God desires. Do we come unfreely? No, we come freely. I don't know how God could say it any clearer. Are our wills in bondage? In a manner of speaking, yes, but in another manner of speaking, no. We will be condemned if we do not choose what we freely could have chose. If we couldn't freely choose it, then we would not be condemned. The second thing we want to say the Bible clearly teaches, we are created in God's image and we are drawn by God. We know we're creating God's image. God created man in his own image. What is God's image? I would suggest to you that one of the most important things about God's image is the ability to choose. We are not animals. We are not plants. We have the ability to reject Christ or accept him. And our free will is one of the things that makes us in God's image. I would ask 
in what way are we created in God's image if we have a conception of humanity as defined by Kelvin and Reformed thinkers? Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God has put eternity in our hearts. I would suggest to you that our free will does not negate God's sovereignty. We have free will because God sovereignly gave it to us. We have free will because God is sovereign and chose to give us free will. Let me answer John 6, 44. Remember, no one can come unless the Father draws him. John 12, 32 answers the puzzle. Jesus said, I, if I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. We have God's image in us, which I suggest to you, intrinsic to that is our free will. And God draws us. We're not just free to choose from among many options, but God is rooting for us to come to him. It's not just random. God is trying to draw us. He loves us. He sent his son to die for us. And he is drawing all peoples to himself. And then thirdly, I believe clearly the Bible teaches that regeneration does not ever precede faith. Faith precedes regeneration. There is not one scripture, Old or New Testament, where we even see a hint of someone being regenerated and then having faith. Here's a couple of obvious examples. Paul says to the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 26, You are all sons of God, not everybody, but you are, through faith in Christ Jesus. How did you become a regenerate, born-again son of God? Through faith. Which came first? It's not a chicken or egg thing. No. Our faith came first. Of course, before that, what came? God's grace. We are saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves, but... It is through faith, and once you place your faith in Christ, you become a son of God. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul tells Timothy, From childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, which came first. Faith did. You got salvation because you had faith. You didn't get faith because you were saved by God, arbitrarily, without your choice, without your agreeing. Faith precedes regeneration in the scripture. Even in Ephesians 2.8, remember their beloved proof text. I don't want to bore you with Greek, but I've got to give you the Greek so you can understand what they teach is not, only, is not an option. It is, it is the exact opposite of what the Bible's teaching. For by grace we've been saved, God's grace. God took the first step. God did everything that we needed. We don't do anything. All we do is receive God's gift. But as I mentioned this morning, all the Greek nouns have gender, feminine or masculine, or non-gender, neuter. Grace is a word that is in the feminine, and it's feminine singular. So for by grace, you have been saved, and that is, you have been saved as a masculine plural participle, and it means male and female, but it's us, through faith, which is also feminine, and that, neuter singular, that is a pronoun, which would refer back to something, but there's nothing in the sentence that is neuter for it to agree to. It can't be grace is not of yourselves, because that's feminine. It can't be us, because that's masculine. It can't be faith, because that's feminine. That, neuter singular, has to mean the whole thing. What is not of ourselves? Salvation, the whole ball of wax. Not of yourselves, it is the gift, it is. Neuter singular is the gift of God. Faith is not the gift of God. Faith is your response to God's gift. It is not what the Bible teaches. And to say, I, I believe they're being dishonest. When a good Greek person like R.C. Sproul says, faith and that not of yourselves, that faith is a gift of God, he's misinterpreting scripture. He should know better. Worse than a Jehovah Witness does when they say in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was, was a God. No, 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 that's not what it says. That's not what it can say. And Ephesians 2.8 teaches the exact opposite of what they try and make it say. What ability is needed to receive a gift? Can a person who is a quadriplegic receive a gift? Even if they can't lift up their hands, can they receive a gift? They put it in their lap, right? And then fourth, D. The Bible teaches as clearly as is possible that we do have a free will. 
4,000 times the Bible tells us to choose. How could the Bible tell us to choose if we don't have the ability to choose? You know, some of them, Joshua 24, 15, choose you this day, choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. Does Joshua assume we have a choice? Of course he does. Notice what Paul says as he's preaching. God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Think for a moment. What does a command assume? If I command, let's all stand together and sing. And you're all in wheelchairs. That's pretty cruel, right? If I command something, if I ask something, it assumes there's ability. Anytime you command something or even ask something, it assumes ability. So if God commands not just Christians who he gives the ability to repent, but he commands all men to repent, you know what that means? Every human being has the ability to repent. I, there's no way around it, right? Okay, so they say, yes, um, foreknowledge is causation. The, the reason God, God, knows it, God knows everything is because God does everything. And I want you to know that that is a logical absurdity to say God knows who's going to be saved because God causes who's going to be saved. That's ridiculous. I can tell you on good authority that the sun will rise tomorrow at 6.53 a.m. Does that mean I'm going to make the sun rise tomorrow at 6.53 a.m.? Of course not. I just looked it up, and it will. Even if it's cloudy, the sun will rise at 6.53. Because I know something is going to happen doesn't mean I caused it. God knows who will be saved. That doesn't mean that God caused it. And so when he says choose, he is giving us a genuine opportunity to choose. He is giving us a real valid choice. It is not just a mirage. So, to illustrate this, we are commanded to choose, repent, and believe, Mark 1.15. Jesus says in his first sermon, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus says this indiscriminately to his entire audience. Is it logical or moral to demand what is impossible? Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to flap your arms and fly. And then hold you responsible for not being able to do what you're not able to do? What if I were to hold a gun to your head and say, flap your arms and fly? Would that be unreasonable, immoral, illogical? I would suggest it does. So first, we are commanded to choose, repent, and believe. And second, a command always assumes ability and free will. We go back to the second chapter of the Bible, the foundation. God said to Adam and Eve, who he made in his image and gave free will, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. If we go back to last week and the sovereignty of God in their mind, omni-causality of God, God knew they were going to sin and God caused them to sin. But then God also told them not to do what he not only knew what they were going to do, but he was going to make them do. No, when God says, don't do this, he is assuming they have free will and they have the right to rebel against him, and they do. And so, a command assumes the ability to agree or not agree, to obey or disobey. It assumes free will. And that's what the Bible teaches from cover to cover. Perhaps most clearly in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments. Does he command them to do something that they inevitably were going to do? It's like me commanding you to breathe. You keep on breathing. Is the, are you doing that because you have free will? No, no. You're going to do it anyway. No, command assumes you don't have to do it. Then verse 19 sums it up. I've set before you life and death, <coughs> blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Does that mean we have to? We must? No, we don't have to. I want you to choose life. Here's the good thing. God gives us a choice, and then God roots for us to make the good choice, but he allows us to not make that choice, and the answer is because of love. Why? Because of if there's no choice, it's not love. We'll get to it later in Irresistible Grace, but love that is forced on someone is rape, isn't it? God gave us choice because the only way that we could give and receive love is if it was chosen and freely received. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's not my will. They go to hell over my dead body. But that the wicked turn from his 
way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. It is God's desire that every sinner turn. Does every sinner turn? No. Do they go against God's will? Yes. That's because they have free will. Every sin is evidence of free will. If God chose it, then it wouldn't be sin. And if God chose it, then God wouldn't be moral. Matthew 23, 37, responsibility assumes ability and free will. Yes, a command assumes ability and free will, but here's the most important one, the moral responsibility. We have a moral responsibility because we could have done otherwise. Morality means isness doesn't equal oughtness. What is is not what ought to be. So when someone mistreats someone else, that's what is. But we say that's not the way it ought to be. To say it's not what it ought to be means God's kingdom has not come, that his will is not done on earth as it is in heaven. If you believe in this system of theology, then you believe isness equals oughtness. Whatever is, is God's will. And I say that's terrible theology. Remember we saw last week, Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which means God's will is not done on earth. That's why we pray for it to be done. But Jesus says in Matthew 23, 37, key passage, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city was just about to crucify him, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who sent there, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So let me ask you an obvious question. Did Jesus want them to repent? He says so. Is Jesus a liar? Did they repent? No. Why? Because God forced them not to? Because they never went? No. Because they were not willing. So does God hold people responsible for something that they are unable to do? Well, that would be immoral, wouldn't it? Romans 10, 21. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Is God saying, I pick those and I don't pick those and you have no free will? No, he's saying, I choose all of you, but only those who come to, by, to me by faith in Jesus Christ will I receive. But he is rooting for us to choose him. He assumes we have the ability and free will and he asks us, he begs us, he pleads with us to do what is right. In the Bible, we see human responsibility because we see human ability and human free will. Why Abraham says in Genesis 18, 25, far be it from you, Lord, to slay the righteous with the wicked. Remember when he is appealing on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham intuitively knows, hey, God's got to be better than I am because if God is worse than I am, then we're in trouble. If God can just capriciously say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you all go to hell, you all go to heaven. If God just arbitrarily condemns people for not doing what they could not do, that's not a good God. Actually, the Bible teaches us responsibility that God is moral and he judges on the basis of what we could do and don't do. And the responsibility is, Ezekiel 18, 20, the soul who sins shall die. If sin is defined as against the will of God, then obviously we have free will. Do we have responsibility? I, the Bible teaches it so clearly, I don't know how it can be missed, but in the very first chapter of John, John writes, that was the true light which gives light to every man. Every man, what does every man mean? Every man coming into the world. He was in the world, the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Why, because they couldn't know him? No, remember that Romans one tells us they could have. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. By their own free will, Jesus tells us in Matthew 23, 37. But, here's the good news, the gospel. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Which comes first, regeneration or faith? Faith. To those who received him, God regenerated them, made children of God to those who believe in his name. That comes first. Remember I've said it is absurd, it is illogical, and it is immoral to judge someone for not doing something they can't do. So now I want you to picture this Calvinist God looking at a baby and asking the baby to go out and fend for itself, feed itself, go get a job as a matter of fact. I want you to get dressed, I want you to get out there and get a job, and I want you to earn a paycheck, a two-week-old. Imagine this twisted person holding a gun to the child's head 
and saying, come on, if you don't get out there and get a job, you're going to starve. I'm not going to feed you. You've got to do it yourself. You've got to repent. You've got to believe. That is a ridiculous scenario to us. But that is not as evil as the God of this view. A God who not only lets someone go hungry, but sends them to hell eternally for not doing something they could not do. That is not the God of the Bible. This is not a minor doctrine. This is a major departure on a major doctrine, the very nature, the holiness, and the goodness of God. And so the Bible teaches clearly that we do have a free will. We are commanded to choose, repent, and believe. God would never command us to do something we can't do. We are commanded that assumes we have the ability and we have free will, and our responsibility assumes we have a free will. Here's the catch. For me, total inability removes all human moral responsibility. If I don't have free will, then I can't feel guilty for the sin I commit, even if it's a terrible sin, because ultimately it's God's will. Total inability for me is the ultimate excuse to stand before God and say, I don't deserve to go to hell. It's not my fault. It's your fault. You didn't choose me. You didn't give me the ability. I didn't have the choice. And they would have something if that was the way it really was. Calvinists would say that it gives God more glory. I would say it doesn't make God more glorious. It makes God a tyrant, and it gives us an excuse. And so am I picking at a minor thing? I don't believe so at all. I believe this is a terrible cancer for the church. It is something that is growing within Southern Baptist circles. It is growing especially in our colleges. And it is a dangerous, dangerous, deceptive doctrine that will kill evangelism and excuse sin and degrade God. So I believe that it's time to take a stand for some necessary roughness. Next week we look at what many find to be the most offensive, unconditional election. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are a moral God, a loving God, one not so insecure that you had to mis micromanage and had to choose everything lest someone not glorify you. I thank you that you were willing to take the risk to give us a choice, knowing <coughs> that many, if not most, would reject your gracious offer of love. But that's what love is. And so, Lord, I thank you for making us in your image and coming and dying for all of us and giving us the gracious offer of salvation. Lord, thank you for being who you are and help us to worship you as the Almighty and to respond with the free will that you've given us by not only receiving Christ as Savior, but by serving you all the days of our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming.